I'm John Hanover. Uh, many of you remember I lectured a few weeks ago uh, on glycans. Uh, and Wynn has asked me to fill in today to proctor this session of demystifying medicine. Um, it's particularly appropriate. Um, I come from the institute that uh, both Rebecca and, and Aaron come from. Um, and uh, it's, it's an area of, of interest of mine, too. And so uh, the topic today will be on obesity uh, and, and the kinds of fat the ever increasing number of kinds of fat that we're um, that that makes up the obesity um, phenotype. And um, for those of us who went to medical school and graduate school in the 1960s and 70s, the adipocyte was a storage reservoir, and that was the way it was taught in medical school, um, and that was the way it was up until fairly recently, uh, with the discoveries um, associated with hypothalamic input into um, the kinds of fat that we produce and the mechanisms of what fat, uh, the, the fat tissues do. And today what we're going to be hearing about are the sort of the many and varied talents of the adipose organ, as it's called now, um, I think. I think we're going to hear that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you shouldn't think of fat as one thing. Um, it's really uh, because of its role in thermogenesis, uh, macronutrient storage, and many other uh, Phenotypes. It's actually quite a diverse and extremely exciting area of research, um, and we're going to be hearing from two of the strongest advocates of this research in the intramural program, um, Aaron uh, Sipas and uh, Rebecca Brown. And um, I'm going to introduce each one separately so that we they get proper introduction. I want to start with with Aaron. I think he'll be beginning today's session. So. Um, Aaron is currently the acting chief of the translational physiology section in our institute. Um, he actually has a chemistry degree at, from Princeton. Um, he did his MD at Cornell, and correct me if any of this is wrong, Aaron, um, and then has a doctoral degree from Rockefeller. Um, he was an assistant investigator at the Joslin Diabetes Center um, and then an associate professor at Harvard, assistant professor, uh, and he had the privilege of working with Ron Kahn, my good friend Ron, who has taught many of us about insulin resistance in the metabolic um, and his focus in his own research is on the mechanisms of um, adipogenesis and the roles of brown and white fat uh, in obesity. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Aaron. And our second speaker will be Rebecca Brown, and, and she's going to take a little different approach, but you're going to, I guarantee you, you need to stay today because you're, you're going to learn a lot about adipose tissue. Thank you very much, John. That was uh, a great introduction to what we're going to be talking about here today because this issue of what I was taught in medical school for me in the early 90s. Okay. Go ahead. There we go. What happened in the early 90s and where we are today is really the great transition within the field of adipose tissue research. So obesity, brown and other fat, I guess that's a more of a brown-centric view towards things. And I realize as you'll listen to Dr. Brown, you'll hear a different side of it, but all complementary. Okay. And I have to put this conflict of interest disclosure. I'm going to be talking about the use of a medication. It's called Mirabigron. And we're going to describe its use at a dose of 200 milligrams acutely, which is higher than the FDA's highest approved dose of 50 milligrams for treating overactive bladder. That makes no sense to you necessarily right now, but it will at the end of the talk. I also have no relationship with Estella's Pharmaceuticals. Okay. So the objectives for this particular talk is that we first want to distinguish the structural and functional differences between brown and white adipose tissue. Then we'll identify which imaging modalities are available to study brown fat function and why you need imaging. Then we'll list the interventions already shown to increase brown adipose tissue mass and activity. And at the end, hopefully you'll, based on the currently available data, describe the likelihood that brown adipose tissue will be a treatment target for obesity and diabetes. Okay. We always show this slide, but I think it, it's relevant for two reasons. One, you could easily believe that too much fat is highly morbid. These are the rates of obesity from 94 through 2007. The next picture is no better. And the same thing with diabetes, and they're moving up the same way, showing the pathophysiological connection between the two of them. But as Dr. Michaels told me in 1992 when I started medical school, 50% of the details that we're going to teach you here will be wrong in 20 years. Uh, he was right. And that is probably even a higher number when it comes to adipose tissue. Um, in particular, 
there are at least two types of fat. Um, one we like to think of as the white adipose tissue or WAT, and that is involved with energy storage, as you just heard. Then there's brown adipose tissue or BAT, which is involved in uh, energy consumption. To put it in perspective, white adipose tissue, 50 grams, two ounces, holds roughly 300 to 500 kilocalories. We did the calculation, the back of the envelope, and a typical 80 kilogram person has about 170,000 pieces of toast in them in terms of energy, just to see how long you can go just on the energy that you've stored in your body. Now, white fat gets a bad rap because too much causes all sorts of metabolic disease and cancers. However, not having enough, as you'll hear about from Dr. Brown, is also a problem. But it's also a lot of things in between, as we'll get to. Brown adipose tissue is responsible for energy expenditure. And as a parallel concept, 50 grams consumes 100 to 300 kilocalories per day if maximally activated. Now, there's a question mark there because we're not entirely sure what you do with 50 grams of brown adipose tissue. This number could be an order of magnitude too low, an order of magnitude too high, and we'll find out over the next 15 to 20 years exactly what those numbers are. Now, this is achieved in brown adipose tissue through the expression and activation of uncoupling protein 1, or UCP1, which leads to the generation of heat, also known as thermogenesis, and I'll show you at a mechanistic level how that occurs. Now, one of the things that I was told or led to believe or just stuck in my head was that the amount of white fat that an adult human has is fixed and that the cells get larger or smaller, but there's really not much turnover over time. Now, that is clearly not true in the animal model, and I'll show you an example here. This is a mouse raised at 28 degrees, and the adipose tissue was dissected out exquisitely well by Severio Cinti at the University of Ancona. And you can see that a lot of the adipose tissue is white. Um, it's actually a little bit misleading because the adipose tissue in humans is yellow. So <laughs> already a misnomer there. The brown adipose tissue in a mouse is in the interscapular region. That's between the shoulder blades. And that's the principal brown adipose tissue depot in a rodent. Now, the key thing to appreciate is that 28 degrees is roughly thermoneutrality for a mouse. So it doesn't need to stay warm by expending energy. But take that same mouse and put it at 6 degrees Celsius a little over 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and keep it there for about 10 days. And in that short period of time, there's a profound browning of the adipose tissue depot. You can see you're nearly doubling in size of the interscapular brown fat, and all of these white cells are now brown. One of the questions that obviously has been um, exciting within the field is, do those white cells become brown? Is there trans differentiation? Some would say yes. And just as angrily, some will say absolutely not. These brown cells are coming from precursor cells that live within the depot. I'm not going to get into the debate any more than mentioning that that exists. I'd also like to point out that these are brown adipocytes. And they actually look brown. This is colored for effect. But they look brown because there's a lot of mitochondria, a lot of iron in these cells, and that makes them look brown. In addition, there's a lot of blood going through. So that really does look like brown adipose tissue when you see it in a mouse. Um, these cells, these brown adipocytes that grow within white adipose tissue depots are often called beige because if you mix brown within white, you get something that's beige colored. They're also called bright from brown within white. Um, which side of the Atlantic you are is more or less determines which term you're going to use, although that seems to be changing. So there's brown adipocytes, and they're involved in cold-induced or non-shivering thermogenesis so that when a mouse, before it starts to shiver, it can turn on the thermogenic properties within the brown adipose tissue and stay warm without the need to shiver. So that's one use. There's also something called diet-induced thermogenesis. And this is a more controversial concept, but basically the, the notion is that, at least for a period of time, when an animal begins to weigh more than what its set point in the hypothalamus and other parts of the brain would like it to be, brown adipose tissue is engaged, and that excess energy that's being stored in fat is then burned off. So there's an increase in the metabolic rate. This diet-induced thermogenesis is attributed to brown adipose tissue. And the thing to keep in mind is that one sees in the mouse, there are these two physiological processes by which energy is taken and consumed in a safe and regulated manner. And brown adipose tissue has been in mammals, we think, for at least 50 million years. So if this were in humans, this would be a very useful thing to have, as we'll talk about more. Now, how does brown fat consume fuel to generate heat? Well, in the response to cold, norepinephrine is ultimately released by the sympathetic neurons. That leads to lipolysis of the endogenous lipids, 
a profound uptake of glucose, which we'll talk about more later, and nonesterified or free fatty acids. Those go into the cells and ultimately into the mitochondrion, so the TCA cycle. And then the hydrogen atoms are split into protons, which go into the intermembrane space. And also the electrons move down the electron transport chain, ultimately meeting oxygen to make water. And then the protons will go down the F1, F0 ATPase to make ATP. So you learn about this in biochemistry. This is the standard process. However, the brown adipocyte has uncoupling protein 1, or UCP1. And what that does is that it allows the protons to come through, not so much as a channel, but as a fatty acid transport, uh, fatty acid dependent transportation mechanism for protons come back into the matrix, and it also leads to heat instead of the chemical energy being generated. So brown adipose tissue is very exciting because it could be involved in consuming fuel to generate heat and potentially treating obesity. But there's another reason why brown adipose tissue may be interesting physiologically, and that's in terms of being a fuel sink. Uh, take a cold acclimated mouse, and that was done by Alexander Bartelt working with Jörg Heron in a paper that was published about six years ago. And in these cold acclimated mice, their brown fat was maybe 5% of their total body weight. Not a lot, but when those animals were fed triglycerides, more than 50% of the triglycerides and more than 75% of the glucose ingested was consumed by the brown adipose tissue in the process of keeping the animals warm. So one of the things that may be possible is that brown adipose tissue in the right circumstance could be used to treat hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, and other kinds of metabolic disease. So energy balance number one, metabolic regulation number two, and then number three is the potential endocrine roles for brown adipose tissue. And this is very, very fresh information. I mean, if you think about it, in 1992 when I started medical school, brown, white fat stored calories, and then Two years later, leptin, a hormone that's released by white adipose tissue, was discovered, and now we have the adipose organ. Well, brown fat is now coming online. There are potential hormones released by it. Neregulin-4 was identified by John D. Lynn's group at the University of Michigan, and binding BRB3-4 leads to, in the liver, an increase in, um, de de no decrease in de novo lipogenesis with an increase in fatty acid oxidation and an increase in insulin sensitivity. In addition, in the paper that was published Last month in Nature, met, uh, in Nature by Ron Kahn's group, they found that brown adipocytes release exosomes with microRNAs that were found to regulate, in this case, the liver to suppress the production of FGF21. So this is another way that brown adipose tissue might be an endocrine organ. And here is a figure from a paper that was published yesterday online from my colleague Yuwa Tseng at Giles and Diabetes Center, where they found that brown adipocytes are releasing a lipid molecule 1213 dihome in response to cold that could be having both autocrine and endocrine roles in increasing fatty acid uptake and fatty acid oxidation. So this area is exploding. It's all new. And these are studies to suggest that brown adipose tissue is a very important and physiologically relevant endocrine organ as well. OK. So what about humans? Well, the story is a little bit more complicated. Um, there was a lot of excitement back in the 1970s and 80s that humans had brown adipose tissue, and then it faded. And then in 2002, in an entirely different area of medicine, in nuclear medicine in particular, there was the introduction clinically of a new um, method of studying cancer, and that is the PET-CT scan. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, CT stands for computed tomography, and that looks at structure. So shown here is a CT scan of a 32-year-old man. This is what we call a coronal image, so here's the neck. Here's the heart, here are lungs. Lighter things like white bones here are denser material. Dark means that it's very uh, light material, such as air in the lungs. And the fat is here along the sides, somewhere in between. Now, the PET stands for positron emission tomography. In this case, the uptake of fluorodeoxyglucose, which implies metabolic function. Metabolically active tissues that take up a lot of glucose, such as tumor tissue, will be shown as taking up an enormous amount of glucose. Here's the heart here. Here's the brain here, and in this person, he had Hodgkin's disease, and he has a lot of uptake in his shoulder region. Now, this was a problem until the ability to fuse those scans in the PET-CT, shown here, and that gives you the metabolic activity of each tissue. And it turns out that all this uptake is not, fortunately, tumor returns, recurrence, but rather activated adipose tissue. So there was this FDG-AVID adipose tissue, or in one of my earliest grant applications, fat. 
I wasn't trying to be cheeky. That's what it was. But it got me in a lot of trouble. So I presented all this information and proposed that there could be metabolically relevant brown adipose tissue in adult humans. And then someone challenged me. And these are the emails between me and him. I wrote to him, but you believe that there's no significant brown fat in adult humans? And that what we see on PET CT is not brown fat? And the response was, yes, that's pretty much it. I would be very surprised if those PET images were brown fat deposits. And that is from a KOL, a key opinion leader. It was a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and an endocrinologist. And he was absolutely convinced, for certain reasons, that there was no functional brown fat in adult human beings. Now, I just showed you those images from four years before. Well, it turns out that in the realm of nuclear medicine, it was the exact opposite. I wrote to somebody else and said, those, in those FDG PET scans, you very often see false positive signals from brown fat. How do we know that it's brown fat? Because everyone says so. And that was the state of the nuclear medicine community. It was also the pathologists were the same way. They were getting tissue that was, for example, supposed to be a parathyroid gland, and instead it turned out to be brown fat. The surgeons weren't happy about it. And the pathologists were like, all right, well, it's not what you thought it was. So this doesn't happen only in our field, but this, I think, is a fairly common phenomenon at the edges of clinical medicine and research. One set of group thinks that something doesn't exist or behaves a particular way, and an entirely different group has new information that they're paying attention that leads to the exact opposite conclusion. So what do you do? You try to reconcile the information with data. In our case, what we were able to do is we identified a woman who had had a PET CT scan, shown here as her imaging, she had what they thought was a tumor. This is the axial image here. This is a PET. You can see a lot of glucose uptake here. This is the CT scan, and this is the tumor. It looks like fat. This is the liver here, much smaller. And here's the heart. So this FDG avid adipose tissue. Now, pathology departments, you submit the sample, and it's stored as a library. So I went to the library, took out the tissue, and then in the collaboration with Yuwa Tseng, um, sectioned it, and it looks exactly like a brown adipose tissue that one would see in a mouse and it stained very avidly for UCP1. And this was, in our case, the first demonstration that what was being seen in the images was truly what we had expected them to be based on the histology. And now with that proof, uh, it turns out that we and four other groups throughout the entire world were working on this question at the exact same time. We're all told that brown fat didn't exist, we didn't believe it, and within a span of five weeks back in 2009, almost exactly eight years ago, Three papers were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and two others at the same time in other journals were able to show that, yes, there is brown adipose tissue in humans, it is functional, and it may be biologically relevant. So what did we learn? Structurally, it was predominantly in, one, in specific regions of the body, and I'll show you what those are, and we can measure it non-invasively via PET-CT. Before, we had to rely on biopsies, which is not reliable when it comes to being able to understand the whole body function. It protects against cold acutely. There's your non-shivering thermogenesis. And we're still trying to figure this out today. People with detectable brown fat were more often, more often female, younger, leaner, and not taking beta blocker medication. So there's a lot that's loaded in there. And that's still been borne out by the prospective studies that I'll talk about. And most importantly, nearly every adult human has some brown fat. Everybody in this room, probably. All right. So the next questions to us became these. Going back to the issues I brought up originally, to what extent does adult human brown adipose tissue contribute? to increase energy expenditure. Second, how does brown fat's uptake of plasma glucose and triglycerides impact whole body fuel metabolism? And then finally, how does activated human brown fat interact with other organs in regulating metabolism? And so the way we go about this is that we have to refine our non-invasive imaging because that's the only way to study the full body tissue. And we use PET CT, MRI, and ultrasound. I'll tell you a little bit about this. But then we have to go back to the lab and do our integrated physiology, looking at human, rodent, and in vitro models for bioenergetics, proteomics, and genomics. And these two come together to be able to allow us to go back to the bed and look for therapeutics. And I'll show you a little bit about cold activation and also drugs and hormones, in particular the beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonists. And the first thing I was talking about, we want to look at this. Now, this is my favorite textbook in medical school, Frank Netter's Atlas of Human Anatomy. It is exquisite. It is wonderful. I still look at it today. But it's incomplete. Sure, you can look at the vertebral column. The bones are well-defined in the body. We've known about them for thousands of years. And the muscles have been defined very well, too. But there's something missing. Where's the fat? Right? 
My hope is that within 15 to 20 years, when you buy the most recent version of Netters, it will have a new set of pages to talk about the adipose tissue depots in the body. You're going to get a fat map. And toward that end, we are working on this. And this is work that I'm, we're doing in collaboration with Kong Chen, led by uh, Brooks Leitner, a post-baccalaureate fellow within the lab. And we're making the bat map, or the batless, the brown fat atlas. And this is 1.0 version. So shown here is a person with a lot of brown fat, 500 grams of brown adipose tissue. And Brooks was able to segregate the brown adipose tissue into six defined depots. There's the cervical in dark blue, supraclavicular, axillary, then the anterior mediastinal, which is this orange area, but the axillary, um, the paraspinal going down the back, and the abdominal slash retroperitoneal fat here. And this is the first time that anybody's been able to really put a characterization about it. And I want to point out something that we won't go into greater detail now. Notice that it's mostly in the posterior regions of the body. There's not a lot of brown fat in the anterior regions, and we believe that relates to what brown fat is supposed to do, which is to generate heat and get it into the blood to get through the rest of the body. All right, so how much brown fat could a person have? And this is work that's unpublished and hopefully will be uh, published soon. Um, you can see here we've looked at 20 men, lean and obese, and the colored portion is the amount of brown fat in each one of these depots, and the white box around it is the amount of white fat in those depots. And the key thing to appreciate is, on average, there's about 1,000 grams of fat in these depots. And the brown fat is roughly 240 grams of it, therefore about 20 to 25%. And 4% of the total body fat mass is in this entire depot. So we're talking about a small portion of the entire fat within the body, but it may be very important metabolically. As an example, here's a 19-year-old man, 22.3 BMI. You can see the red is his brown adipose tissue. The blue is the remaining white fat in those regions. Well, could you turn that brown fat, that white fat to brown? Is that possible? And we're looking at this in collaboration with Carol Pachak and NICHD. And you can see here, this is a woman with a bladder paraganglioma, 64 years old, with a very low BMI, body mass index. And this paraganglioma is releasing norepinephrine to the blood at levels that are well, by definition, physiological, because she's making it, but certainly not normal when the typical range is 112 to 750, OK? Well, what did that do? That led to a profound browning of the adipose tissue in the region where the tumor was. So her white plus brown fat in the body is 460 grams. Her active fat is 300 grams. 65% of those regions are now brown because she is being chronically exposed the high level of catecholamines, which both activate brown fat acutely, but also cause it to grow. And you can see here in this particular region, 175 grams of total fat, and brown fat is 90% of that region. So is it possible to turn your white into brown, at least in those places? We think yes. All right, so let's move on to therapeutics. Cold exposure is the mechanism by which most people will activate brown adipose tissue because it is certainly the easiest to work with and the most physiological, and shown here is a study led by Paul Lee with Francesco Celli, done at the NIDDK here. Five volunteers were sleep, slept in a month at 24 degrees, then 19, then 24 again, and then 27. You can see the brown fat here in the red. It's at a certain amount in the shoulders. It then increased in terms of metabolic activity after a month in the cold, went back to where it was at the original room temperature, and then when it's warm, the brown fat is gone. So this tissue is plastic. It can both increase and decrease its metabolic activity based on chronic stimulation. In addition, um, cold exposure was tested out by our colleagues in the Netherlands, uh, Patrick Schwauen and Walter von Mark Lichtenbelt. They looked at eight subjects with type 2 diabetes, 10 days of cold acclimation, 14 to 15 degrees Celsius. That's roughly 56 to 58 Fahrenheit for roughly six hours. It led to an increase in the detectable brown adipose tissue activity, shown here and here and also led to an increase in the glucose infusion rate, meaning that there was an increase in insulin sensitivity whole body with the cold exposure. And so it appears to be um, the potential to increase the mass of human brown fat and to augment energy expenditure as an approach to treating metabolic disease. Now, the big problem or unknown here is how much of this cold exposure was affecting the brown fat that then leads to the increase in glucose uptake. We don't know that. This is a whole body measure. So that remains unknown. It's at least promising and identifies more studies to do. So we like to use a pharmacological approach for this reason. For one thing, um, there's potential for more specific targeting of human back. Cold exposure works on the entire body. Animal models have already shown they're very effective. 
there's likely greater adherence. If I took a poll of the people and sitting in this room, which would you rather do? Sit in a room that's cold with a t-shirt and shorts for four to six hours every day for a month, or take two to four pills in the morning every day for a month? So who would choose the cold? Brooks, not even? You, <laughs> who would take two to four pills a day for a month if you knew that it was going to get rid of your obesity ah, or make you feel better? All right, fine. I think the uh, pharmacological wins. That's what I would have thought. And anyways, combinations approaches may be necessary. We may need to combine cold with a medication or two different kinds of medications that work on different parts of physiology to get the effect that we want to see. And the beta-3 adrenergic receptor, there's a beta-1, which is on the heart that increases heart rate. Beta-2 is on the lungs. That leads to an increase in bronchial size um, and diameter. Beta-3 is expressed by human brown and white fat. And what appears to be from Chrissy Vertanen's paper and Sven Enerbach back in 2009 is that there's more beta-3 expression in the brown fat compared to the white fat. We looked at a similar kind of issue in mouse versus human tissue. Here is the beta-3 receptor. Human deep neck fat, where there's a lot of brown fat, there's a lot of beta-3 receptor, and there's a lot less beta-3 receptor in the superficial neck fat of a human. Whereas notice that the, brown, the white and brown fat of a mouse have a similar expressions of the beta-3 receptor. I don't have time to go into this today, but Cheryl Chetto, a postdoctoral fellow in our group, has identified the problem with studying this tissue is that the beta-3 receptor is much higher expressed in mouse brown fat and white fat than in human brown fat and white fat. And the failure of using drugs related to these, as I'll show you, is due in part to the fact that mice are a lot different from humans. And while that may be obvious, knowing what the differences are in each particular circumstance has been a challenge. And this is a several billion dollar challenge because drugs have been developed and failed not realizing the implications of the difference between mice and men and women. So it turns out the beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonists can now be used widely in humans. There are 45 million people who are affected by overactive bladder in the United States of America. Now, this, this study was done by the companies that are involved in selling overactive bladder drugs. So I don't know if that number is exactly right, but it's certainly a lot. And it's not something that people brag about. So it's not easy to find out how often it is. But it's certainly an important and unmet medical need. Compare that, for example, to 26 million people in America with type 1 and 2 diabetes. Now, besides adipose tissue, there are beta-3 adrenergic receptors in the urinary bladder on the muscle, as Cheryl has shown, and activation relaxes the bladder. So that's very exciting. And it turns out that in 2012, the FDA approved a beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonist called Mirabigron for the treatment of overactive bladder at 50 milligrams daily. And this is the molecule, not a very fancy one. This portion here on the left is what binds to the receptor, and this portion here on the right is what achieves the selectivity for the beta-3 over the beta-1 and beta-2 receptors so that you could give this drug, relax the bladder, and not cause the heart rate to go up. So we first needed to prove that this drug could work. So this is a proof of concept study design, and this was led by Lauren Weiner, who worked with me at Giles and Diabetes Center back in Boston. And we recruited 12 young, lean, healthy men. And the reason why we studied men is that there were questions about the safety at this dose in women. And each one of the men was treated acutely with placebo, Mirabigron at 200 milligrams. Now, this is higher than the dose that's approved. And the reason we did this is that we knew 200 milligrams would be safe, relatively so, and more likely to give us a signal. Because if we missed a signal because we chose the wrong dose, we would have missed the whole point entirely. So we used a higher dose. We also exposed our subjects to mild cold. We monitored vital signs, energy expenditure, we drew blood prior to imaging, and we measured the brown fat metabolic activity using the FDG PET-CT. What did we find? Well, Mirabigron caused an increase in metabolic rate of 200 kilocalories per day above baseline. That's 13% above baseline. That's even more than we saw with the cold exposure. In addition, as we saw in the FDA literature at the 200 milligram dose, at peak concentration, the systolic blood pressure had gone up with both actually drug and cold not much change in diastolic blood pressure, and an increase in heart rate. So as I'd have to say, don't do this on your own. I've had people write to me, can I take Mirabigron to treat my obesity? And the answer is flatly no. You can't use it at this point. But it is interesting physiologically, and that's what we're trying to understand here. Well, how did Mirabigron do on the brown fat? And I don't show the slides here, but I've been burned several times on things that I thought might activate the brown fat and didn't. So here is a 21-year-old man, a different 21-year-old man with a body mass index of 23. And you can see here the FDG when he took placebo. Here's his heart. 
Here are his kidneys. Here's his brain. And this is where the brown adipose tissue would be. Well, when he was exposed to mild cold, you can see that his brown adipose tissue was, as they say in Boston, wicked active. You see it all over the place here, in the supraclavicular region, paraspinal, and into the kidneys. In addition, you can see that his heart is no longer there. Now, he has a heart. We know that. But this is an example. The heart chose to use glucose because it wasn't much fatty acids in the blood. When a healthy heart has fatty acids available, it takes it up. So the heart disappears because it changes its fuel selection. Very interesting phenomenon that we're trying to study further. So this is what the cold did. What happened with Mirabigron? Well, it caused a profound activation of the brown adipose tissue, as you can see here. We found brown fat in regions we didn't even know there was brown fat at the time. And so this becomes a very useful tool and possibly a therapeutic option, ultimately, because the beta-3 agonist is now able to be used functionally and effectively in humans. So we want to now treat people and make more of this tissue so we can understand it. Remember, we don't have that much in humans. We need more. We also want to understand a lot more about the imaging factors, the therapeutics, and doing some omics. And so this study, which has just been completed and will be submitted for publication soon, I hope, uh, has been done in collaboration with Kong Chen, Rob Brichta, Suzanne McGee, Joyce Linderman in our section. And this has been spearheaded by a postdoc named Allison Baskin, who is sitting in the room right now, along with Brooks. Thanks, guys. And so what we did is we studied, once again, 12 young, lean, healthy men, all with confirmed cold-activated brown fat. Each was treated acutely with the Mirabagron at zero as placebo control, 50 milligrams, which is the FDA-approved dose, and 200 milligrams, which we know worked as our positive control. This time, we did standard monitoring, serial blood draws for PKPD studies to find out how much was in the blood, when it was peaking, and then we did PET-CT and also MR imaging, multiple magnetic resonance imaging. And this was done in collaboration with Ahmed Garib and NIDDK because as much as we like PET-CT, it involves ionizing radiation, which prevents us from studying people frequently and prevents the study of a large number of people who we'd like to understand. And the primary endpoint was the difference in brown fat activity between 0 and 50 milligrams of Mirabagron. And what we found is that you can see in red here is the, this is concentration of Mirabagron in the blood, and this was done in collaboration with Peter Walter, who runs the mass spec core in NIDDK. This is, the red is 200 milligrams, the black is 50 milligrams, and the blue is zero milligrams. And you can see that even though 200 is four times 50, the exposure of a person to the drug is much higher than four times the 200 milligram dose. And you can see here that we did the FDG and PET-CT at the perfect time to get the maximal effect of 50. And we're not even looking at the best effort of 200 milligrams because the concentration is already a little bit lower. So in addition to the fact that 200 is way more exposure than 50, which is, again, the approved dose, the concentrations in the blood are very variable with 200 milligrams and with 50 milligrams, which means that you could give the drug to somebody, the drug won't get in very much and may not have much of an effect. And this is something that we're still trying to deal with today. Now, it was very clear, though, as, as you could see, that there would be a dose response between the drug concentration and brown fat activation. Here's an example from one subject. You can see here at zero milligrams, there's no brown fat. At 50 milligrams, there's a little bit of brown fat in the black areas here. And then at 200 milligrams, there's a lot more brown fat activity. And this is what we typically saw, as I'll show you. These green dots are what we call fiducial markers because in order to be able to use MRI, we were able to line them up using these markers here. So this is exploratory. Here is the magnetic resonance imaging of the fat. And you can see the white here is fat. And then we can overlay the PET CT image with the PET, the PET with the MR, and we can find out where the brown fat is using PET MR. And so this is further being developed. So ultimately, someday, we can use MR imaging and no ionizing radiation at all. And this has been done also in collaboration with Ahmed and Peter Herskovich. All right, so what did we find, the key endpoint? 50 milligrams of Mirabagron in our subjects caused an increase of brown adipose acti tissue activity in nine of the 12, and this is the, you know, nine is not much above zero, but it was above zero. So did 50 milligrams work? Absolutely. Did 200 milligrams work? Yes, way better. As you can see here, there's a line break. So the key thing here is that 50 milligram works, but it's not nearly as effective as the 200 milligram dose. And this was also borne out in the energy expenditure studies we found that there was no significant increase in energy expenditure at zero, a trivial amount with 50, and a substantial increase with 200 milligrams of Mirabagron that was significant. Moreover, in addition to the fact that Mirabagron activated the brown fat and that it increased energy expenditure, we found a significant relationship 
between the change in resting energy expenditure shown here, shown here on the y-axis, and the amount of brown act fat activity that we saw here, and each color represents the different dose. And this is an important point. It's not just that the drug increased energy expenditure, but we believe that the brown fat was responsible for some of that increase in energy expenditure. You can activate brown fat, and you may be able to increase the amount of oxygen consumption and energy expenditure, meaning that possibly there could be an effect in a significant way on energy balance. And so our final summary, key points. Brown adipocytes can be found in a substantial proportion of adult humans. Nearly everybody in this room, I would imagine, has at least some. Both cold and pharmacological activation of human brown fat can substantially increase its mass and energy expenditure, but the extent of which remains unknown. Brown fat may therefore impact human metabolism at three different levels, our key point. Energy balance and weight loss, possibly, but that's number one. Glucose and fatty acid metabolism, number two. And then number three, at hormonal regulation, and there is still an enormous amount that needs to be learned. And in order to get at that, a plug for our new study, the physiological responses and adaptation of brown adipose tissue to chronic treatment with beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonists. We are going to recruit healthy men and women this time. We'll bring, and actually, our initial study is going to be with healthy women, we want to see if after four weeks of treatment with Maravigran, the beta-3 agonist, can we increase the amount of detectable brown fat activity? And as a side point to that, can we also see the beginnings of changes of metabolic benefit from chronic activation of brown adipose tissue? And with that, I'd like to thank the enormous number of people who have let all of our studies happen and succeed, in particular, Joyce Linderman, Allison Baskin, Cheryl Chetto in our particular section, uh, Kong Chen, Brooks Leitner, Courtney Duckworth, Duckworth, and others who we have been working with within Diab, and all of our collaborators within Nutrition, Mass Spec, LabCorp, um, our collaborators across the NIH, in the CRC, and then the people who, with whom we work at Harvard University. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, there, we'll, I think we should take a few questions while they're fresh on your mind, and then we'll take a little break. Uh, go ahead and take your questioners there. Okay. Okay. Well, the big by urinary retention. Great question. So, no. Um, the issue of urinary retention is significant as, as the, only if someone had at baseline a bladder outlet obstruction. And so bladder outlet obstruction is an exclusion criterion that we use when recruiting people. But there were no symptoms whatsoever um, related to bladder outlet in the study that we conducted. Ken. There are some drugs on the market that block norepinephrine transport. That's a great question. I think that theoretically they could. And I'd want to look at the studies in rodents first to even get, to get a sense of how good they could be. And the reason I say that is that ephedrine, for example, activates brown adipose tissue in the rodent model very nicely. It also activates it in humans at doses that are, I would never use, but have been used. And so we'd want to get a sense of, is it possible at a level that might be translated to a human? So I think it's theoretically possible, but practically it may not be effective. In the back, yeah? Um, and then if uh, like a population study between countries or polar regions and equatorial regions, because 20 degrees to someone that lives in England is actually quite warm. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so that's a great question. Uh, so the first thing is that I, I didn't conduct that study. It was done here before I arrived. Um, and, and they were done sequentially. It was like one month right after the other. Um, I don't know what would happen in other circumstances. We don't know what happened to the white adipose tissue specifically. That can now be quantified. We haven't looked at it, whether there were substantial changes in any of those. There might be. It was um, something to further look at. Now, related to the other country, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that we wonder about. How much brown fat was in a typical human being 100 years ago when you spent your time in the cold 
all the time. It may be that that, you know, there was not 20% brown versus white in those depots, but it might have been closer to 80 to 90% since people were cold. And that would be interesting because people were leaner back then also. And it wasn't just because they didn't have anything to eat. Yes, in the back. Oh. To me. Are you are you saying that diabetes contributes to fat accumulation, or fat accumulation contributes to diabetes? And there are two types of diabetes: type one and type two. Right, so, right. So the type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and it's entirely separate from what we're talking about. Type two diabetes. This is a big debate, but. I happen to be falling more on the side that the more adipose tissue, the more white adipose tissue somebody has, the more the me metabolic milieu of the body transitions towards insulin resistance leading to diabetes. That's how I would say the mechanism occurs in those circumstances. But diabetes too occurs later on in life of a person. So it's not something that it sort of random, random pops up at some point in life. Right, right. No, there, there is certainly a progression. Yes? There's a microphone coming for you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about the subjective experiences of the, of the high brown fat um, of subjects. Right. Whether they felt hot, whether they felt cold, um, that kind of thing. Right. So, great question. I'll tell you this much. The people who I've seen have the most amount of brown fat seem to tolerate cold very well. And so if someone says, oh, I'm really cold, that may mean they don't have much brown fat. I'll turn it to Allison. Do we find that our subjects who have a lot of brown fat feel particularly cold or warm? I don't remember any specific signal coming up from that. Oh, you can give me the mic there. Hi. <laughs> um, so they were in the cold room for the one day, which was our positive control to determine whether or not they had brown fat before we gave them the beta-3 agonist, um, Mirabagron. Looking at that one day where they were subjected to cold, um, there didn't seem to be much of a reported difference um, when we asked them whether or not they were shivering, how cold they were between the people with a lot of brown fat and those with little. So, so the, I don't know. <laughs> so the, the most inexpensive screening tool, do you feel cold more than other people? Probably won't work. We need, we need to do the physiological testing. Would you, uh, despite your reluctance, go into a little bit of the genesis via from bat as opposed to pre myocytes? Oh, we're, we're studying brown and white pre adipocytes in culture to be able to understand the mechanisms by which they are able to grow as screening tools to find perhaps compounds in the future that would be able to be given to humans as a way of increasing brown fat mass and activity. So that is being studied. But there was a lot of talk that pre-myocytes can be converted to brown fat. Yes. Um, is that true or not? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that we're not, we're not looking at that. I think that you can, at some level, transform a pre-myocyte into, the, the, it, at, a, at the right stage of pluripotency, a pre, like a mesenchymal cell that could go towards skeletal muscle also has the opportunity of going towards a classical brown adipocyte. That is possible. We don't work with those, but that is a possibility. Um, it's a reasonable and interesting question as to whether one would try to activate those or not, and there are groups that are looking at that. So you would expect their behavior nevertheless to be similar as opposed to exposure to cold and so on. Beta yes, yes. We, we, we don't know of any difference functionally right now between, for example, the beige and the brown, other than potentially the role of phosphocreatine creatine fetal cycling that's been studied by Dr. Bruce Spiegelman regarding that. But otherwise, there hasn't been a lot of information yet on anything that specifically distinguishes the beige from the brown at a functional level. So there are signals, but not much. Uh, so I was just wondering if you looked at the metabolism of cells in culture um, and if the actual metabolic rate is higher in the brown fat. Um, and then if you were to culture them at a slightly lower temperature, would that increase? Okay, so, there's, so the first answer is yes. Many people, including our group, led by Cheryl Chetto, is trying to study the oxygen consumption rates 
of the brown adipocytes after they've been differentiated in culture? And the simple answer is yes, they have a much higher metabolic rate than the white adipocytes. So that in vitro model does work and it can help us learn a lot about the cell that we can't learn from doing human-based studies. Um, once again, it was Bruce Spiegelman's group that published the paper in PNAS where they showed that if you reduce the temperature of the culture dish, there seemed to be an increase in thermogenesis. I haven't seen that uh, anywhere else, so I don't know how far that's gotten and whether they're still pursuing that information. Okay. Um, I you. think we're going to take, thanks, Aaron. We're going to take maybe a two minute break for anybody who needs a two minute break, three minute break. We'll be nice and say five minutes, and, uh, and then we're going to introduce uh, Rebecca. So thank you guys. Take a quick break and come on, come on back. Our next speaker. Um, is Rebecca Brown, um, and one great thing about these lectures is they allow people like me who've been, I guess I've, we've been colleagues now at least five years, uh, 10 years, I don't know, I've been here since 1979, so it's hard for me to remember, but <clears throat> you know, to, to, to uh, look at the background of our, our colleagues. And Rebecca um, attended Mayo Medical School um, and did a pediatric residency at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. And um, she also did pediatric endocrinology fellowship here at the NIH, and that's, I think, where we met. Um, and, uh, and she's now stayed on and has become a Alaska clinical investigator, one of our really stellar group of young investigators recruited through that mechanism. And um, Rebecca's research focuses on the biology of insulin resistance and leptin using patients with uh, rare forms of severe insulin resistance and um, human models. And I can say on a personal note, my uh, student, David Bolger, who is now at Oxford with Robert Simple, had nothing but kind things to say about Rebecca as a mentor. Uh, you don't, uh, you, you know, when you hear that from a student, you realize you're dealing with a very good mentor. And thank you, Rebecca, for that. So it's my, I can thank you personally. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, is the mic picking me up okay here? So I was, I was telling Aaron as we were chatting before the talks that I gave my talk the somewhat aspirational title of why is fat important. And, and I'm specifically talking about white fat here because sometimes I think with all the hype about the importance of brown fat in the context of obesity and diabetes um, that we lose sight of the importance of white fat. So um, again, as Aaron alluded to, back in the 1990s, we learned that white fat was not merely a passive energy storage depot, but a, a, an active endocrine organ. And this is a slide that I, I stole from Bruce Spiegelman mentioned earlier, um, really just demonstrating a few of the things that are secreted by white adipose tissue. And this was focused on hyperglycemic versus anti-hyperglycemic effects. And what we're really going to be focusing on today, I think I'm just going to use the mouse here, uh, is the role of leptin. So I wanted to give you a little historic context on the discovery of leptin. So leptin was discovered in the context of the OBOB mouse shown here, which was a spontaneously occurring mouse model of obesity. And it was known that the obesity phenotype was inherited in a autosomal recessive manner in these rodents, but nobody knew what the genetic cause was. And there was an interest from NIDDK in uncovering genetics underlying obesity. And so um, it was thought that this was gonna be a very nice model to explore. So Jeff Friedman's group at the Rockefeller used positional cloning, this was back in the days before high throughput sequencing, in order to learn the affected gene, um, which was named the obese gene, and he called its gene product leptin, uh, after the Greek word leptos, which means thin. Uh, and it turns out that these mice have a, a null mutation in the leptin gene so that they don't produce leptin, and that leads to hyperphagia, and, and I'll go through and explain why that is. And so this mice eats too much, and it becomes obese. And leptin is a circulating protein, and if you give leptin back as a therapeutic in these animals, you can completely correct the phenotype. So this is the same mouse after treatment with leptin, uh, and you can see that it's no longer obese uh, and it's no longer hyperphagic. So what's the relevance of this to humans? Well, uh, for one thing, it turns out that there is an extremely rare human form of this mouse disease. This is a child who's age three or four in this picture uh, who has a recessive mutation in the leptin gene uh, with very severe early onset obesity. Um, you can see his excess adipose tissue here. And it turns out that leptin replacement works just as well in humans with leptin deficiency as it does in rodents. This is the same child at age seven, now actually weighing less at age seven than he did at age three or four, which is not the normal pattern of human growth. Uh, and so basically his phenotype has been completely corrected uh, with replacement leptin. 
So what do we know now about leptin's role in the regulation of body weight? So leptin is made by adipocytes, and the amount of leptin that we have circulating in our bloodstream is proportional to our fat mass. And so if you are a healthy human being and you have a normal amount of adipose tissue, you'll have a normal amount of circulating leptin. So let's say that we perturb that equilibrium in some fashion. So now this human or any other mammal is faced with a famine situation. You're starving, you lose your fat stores. So now the amount of leptin that's circulating in your body goes down. And that low leptin is the main signal to our brains that we are starving. So there has to be something as animals that signals to us that we need to eat when we're in a starvation situation. That's what tells the animal to go out and seek food. Okay, so now let's imagine that that famine situation has resolved. You have that low leptin signaling to your brain, you're starving, you need to go out and seek food. And so you go out and seek food and you regain your body weight. So now you have normal fat stores, you have a normal leptin level and homeostasis has been restored. Now this is a problem that we don't face much in the modern world. We're more often facing the opposite scenario. So now let's take somebody who has perturbed their equilibrium and increased their fat stores. Those increased fat stores are gonna be associated with high circulating leptin levels in the blood. So that should decrease our appetites, right? So now we should have a restoration of homeostasis again and normal fat stores. So if this is true, why are there so many people who are suffering from obesity? Okay, why is losing weight so difficult? So we know that if you start off from an obese situation and you lose weight through some mechanism, that you're gonna become more hungry. Okay, so it turns out that our bodies are really much better programmed to restore homeostasis from a loss of fat mass than from an increase in fat mass. And I'm gonna go through more detail on that. So this is a very typical pattern of what happens to people when they try to lose weight. Uh, and these are data from people who participated in Weight Watchers, which is a dietary management program to lose weight. And, and this happens pretty much with any kind of lifestyle modification. So people start off overweight and they lose weight. Uh, Nader body weight is at about six months and then weight starts to creep back up again. So Kevin Hall and NIDDK tried to figure out what was actually leading to the weight regain in these individuals. Is it a loss of willpower? What's really happening? And so he used mathematical modeling in order to understand how much food people must have been eating in order to observe these changes in body weight. And what he calculated is that when you start to lose weight, first of all, the amount of calories that your body is burning very rapidly decreases and then starts to stabilize. But even more dramatically, the energy intake, the amount of food that people consume dramatically decreases. And then almost immediately after they start dieting, that starts to go back up again. And actually by the time they've reached their nadir weight, which was at six months, they're actually almost back to their baseline caloric intake. So why is that? So this exponential decay in diet adherence, again, is this a loss of willpower? What's going on here? So what's happening is that people's appetites are increasing. So as soon as you reduce your caloric intake and you start to lose weight, you feel hungry. And you can see that appetite goes up and then very gradually starts to decrease as caloric intake gets back toward baseline. But there's still this big gap between appetite and calorie intake. And this is the perceived effort that people are putting into their diet program. So um, you'll note that this perceived effort still continues to create that gap between appetite and caloric intake, even after calorie intake is back to baseline. So even once you've started to regain your body weight and you're actually consuming just as many calories as you did before you started your diet program, you feel hungry. You're putting a lot of work into that diet program. Why is that? So weight loss tends to lead to decreased energy expenditure. That's one of the reasons why we have to put more effort into our weight loss programs. And I'm gonna go through some data on that. So um, this concept that when we lose weight, we expend less energy is called metabolic adaptation. It's also called adaptive thermogenesis. These are terms that aren't really very helpful, I think, in conceptualizing what's going on here. So I'm gonna to try to walk you through this. So it's very well established that the amount of energy that we burn on a daily basis relates to our body composition. And specifically, it's very highly correlated with our fat-free mass, basically our muscle mass. So that if you are a person who has 60 kilograms of lean body mass, your resting energy expenditure, the, the energy that you burn just from basic bodily functions by 
breathing and your heart beating is going to be around 1600 calories per day. If you're a smaller person and you only have 40 kilos of lean mass, your resting energy will be around 1200 calories per day. So what happens if you start off as a 60 kilo lean mass person and you lose weight and you become a 40 kilo lean mass person? Is your energy expenditure going to change from 1600 to 1200? Actually, there's bad news related to this. Your energy expenditure will go down well below 1200 calories per day. Um, so if you go from about, I, I'm making up these numbers to some extent, but I wanted to give you the, the general idea. If you go from a higher lean body mass to a lower lean body mass, now your resting energy expenditure is only 800 calories per day. Now this isn't fair. So you take two different people, one who starts off with 40 kilos of lean mass and has never been obese. And that person's resting energy expenditure is 1200 calories per day. And now you take the person who's put all of this effort into their diet and exercise program and has gotten their lean body mass down to 40 kilos, and they only burn 800 calories per day. So there's a, really a, a very major gap in energy expenditure. And you can think about this as an adaptive mechanism. This is the body's way to try to get us back to a higher body weight. Remember that we're really biologically adapted to maintain higher body weights. Our goal is not to die from malnutrition. So we've learned um, a, a lot about the mechanisms that underlie this metabolic adaptation to weight loss. So why is it that our energy expenditure goes down? Um, and some really nice work on this has been done by Rudy Leibel and colleagues. And what he did is he took subjects at their initial body weight um, and he made them lose 10% of their initial body weight by giving them an 800 calorie per day liquid diet. So you start off at 100% of your initial body weight, you go on this diet, uh, and then what he does is that he stabilizes those subjects on exactly the number of calories they need to maintain that 10% reduced body weight. And one of the things that he observed is, as we might expect, leptin levels fall when you lose 10% of your body weight. And in fact, they fell by about 25%. So then he tried to understand uh, what's going on with energy expenditure in these subjects. And so this is total energy expenditure, and he's looking at the difference between the 10% reduced state versus the baseline weight. And you can see that total energy expenditure, if I can get the mouse to work, uh, decreased by about 22% after weight loss. Actually, resting energy expenditure didn't really change much. And so if you take the difference between total energy expenditure and resting energy expenditure, you can see that the bulk of the change in energy expenditure was non-resting energy expenditure, which is the energy that we expend when we move around during our normal daily activities or during exercise. So then he looked at uh, physiological mechanisms that might lead to that reduction in energy expenditure. And he found that catecholamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine were reduced in the weight reduced state. Uh, and sympathetic nervous system tone was reduced as well. Uh, he also found reductions in thyroid hormones and all of these changes would be expected to lead to a decrease in energy expenditure. So then he did something really interesting, which is that he had the hypothesis that the reduction in leptin that we see after weight loss might be causally related to that reduction in energy expenditure that we see after weight loss. And so he took these same subjects who had reduced their body weight by 10% and had had their leptin levels fall by about 25%. And he gave them leptin back as an injection in order to achieve the leptin levels that they had had prior to weight loss. And so now what we're seeing on these graphs are the changes in energy expenditure, thyroid hormones, catecholamines, um, with just the weight loss shown in gray and the weight loss plus leptin replacement to pre-weight loss levels. And what you can see is that the reduction in total energy expenditure was almost completely reversed by leptin replacement. Uh, the same was true for the reduction in non-resting energy expenditure. And he, he looked at something called gross mechanical efficiency, which is basically how efficiently our muscles um, uh, use energy in the context of activity and found that most of this change was accounted for by gross mechanical efficiency. That is, when you lose weight, your muscles become more efficient. And if you replace leptin back to pre-weight loss uh, levels, then your muscles become less efficient again. And sort of looking at, again at these hormone levels, um, the changes in thyroid hormones, uh, at least for T3 and T4, the circulating thyroid hormones uh, were completely abrogated by the leptin replacement. TSH changes actually didn't have any effect with leptin. Uh, and then again, the catecholamine levels were, the changes in catecholamines were reversed by leptin replacement to pre-weight loss levels, as were the changes in sympathetic nervous system tone. So uh, I mentioned to you that leptin is a highly effective therapy in the context of a leptin-deficient rodent or a leptin-deficient human. Is it a highly effective therapy for a sort of garden variety obesity? 
So that study was done in 1999 by Hamesfield and colleagues. They gave lectin replacement to about 200 obese men and women, and they found really not much. So some modest weight loss at the very highest leptin doses, um, but nothing to write home about. So why is this? And I'm going to quote Rudy Leibel's study. Um, and what he said in the discussion of that study is, the primary functional role of leptin is apparently to defend, not reduce, body fat by increasing food seeking and decreasing energy expenditure when fat stores are insufficient. So if we go back to this model, so we know if you start off with normal fat stores and you lose fat stores, low leptin is gonna signal to us to reverse that. Low leptin leads to increased appetite when you lose your body fat. But that proposal that I made to you earlier that high leptin is gonna decrease your appetite turns out to be untrue. And if we think about this again a different way, let's just look at the correlation between body fat and leptin levels. They're very highly correlated, such that somebody who is obese and has high body fat is going to have a high leptin level. And you can think about leptin responsiveness occurring at the very low levels of leptin as a signal of starvation. In somebody who is already obese and has high endogenous leptin levels, that's already above the responsive range for these biological systems. And adding additional leptin as a drug is going to have very little clinical effect. So now we're in the situation where leptin as a hormone or as a, as a drug is really only of utility in people who are leptin deficient. So what are the human conditions that are associated with leptin deficiency? Well, the most obvious one is starvation, but you certainly wouldn't want to give leptin to somebody who is starving um, because that's going to suppress that food seeking behavior and you don't want to further decrease their body weight. The other condition that I mentioned to you are mutations of the leptin gene. These patients, again, become very severely obese, and leptin is a highly effective therapeutic for them. There is another condition that I'm going to talk to you more about, which is really the focus of my research, which is lipodystrophy, and I'll explain what that is. So lipodystrophy syndromes are really a heterogeneous group of disorders, but what they all have in common is that there's a selective deficiency of adipose tissue. Uh, and I hope you can appreciate this in the photos. This is a 16-year-old girl who has generalized lipodystrophy. You can see this very marked muscular appearance to her hip and thigh here. Uh, she also has some xanthomas on her knee, which are a consequence of high triglycerides, and we'll talk about that later. And, and even more dramatically in this photo, this is a four-year-old child who has generalized lipodystrophy. And for those of you who hang out with four-year-old children, they're generally a little bit on the pudgy side, um, and not looking like bodybuilders. Uh, so this is a, really a very marked physical appearance of generalized lipodystrophy. When we think about lipodystrophies, we classify them according to their etiology, as well as the distribution of the missing body fat. So from an etiologic perspective, they can either be genetic um, or they can be acquired. The most common type of lipodystrophy in the world is acquired partial lipodystrophy related to human immunodeficiency virus and treatment with highly active antiretroviral drugs. Uh, this is actually less common now uh, with modern antiretroviral drugs, and I'm not really going to focus on that for this talk. There are also autoimmune forms of acquired lipodystrophy in which the fat cells themselves or the lipid droplets within the fat cells undergo autoimmune destruction. In terms of distribution of body fat, I showed you pictures of patients who have generalized lipodystrophy in which basically all of the fat in the body is missing. Uh, but you can also have partial forms of lipodystrophy in which certain depots of fat are lost and other depots are preserved. And I'll show you pictures to make clear what I'm talking about there. So how do you recognize a patient with lipodystrophy? Well, they typically are going to have a very muscular appearance due to the lack of overlying fat. Uh, you're going to see stigmata of insulin resistance, such as acanthosis nigricans. They typically will have very prominent veins, which is just due to a lack of fat overlying uh, the veins. Um, patients with generalized lipodystrophy often will have a prominent umbilicus or belly button for reasons that aren't really clear. Uh, and they will often have increased abdominal girth. And that is not due to fat. That's actually due to um, increased size of the internal organs, such as the liver. So on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a patient of about the same age. These are both teenage girls, but this patient has partial lipodystrophy. Uh, and there are some features that she has in common. So she has this very muscular appearance to her legs. Uh, she has acanthosis on her back, uh, the back of her neck, again, as a stigmata of insulin resistance. She has the prominent veins. Um, but now you actually see that she has increased fat in certain regions of her body, specifically in the head, neck, and trunk area. So this is demonstrating this depot-specific loss of fat. There's a loss of fat, in her case, in the gluteal uh, and leg areas, to a lesser extent in the arms. But there's preservation of fat in the head, neck, and trunk. 
I'm gonna walk you through the pathophysiology of lipodystrophy. The fundamental problem in these patients is deficient fat mass. Because they have low fat mass, they have low levels of adipocyte-derived hormones, and particularly leptin. That low leptin gets sensed by the hypothalamus as a starvation signal and leads the patients to become hyperphagic. Now, if those of us in this room, I'm assuming nobody has lipodystrophy, become hyperphagic, we're going to store those extra calories in our fat cells, and that's actually a fairly healthy place to store excess calories. That's one of the main jobs of our adipose tissue. But a patient with lipodystrophy has no fat cells in which to store extra calories, and so instead, they wind up storing extra calories in ectopic locations, such as the muscle and the liver. And this ectopic lipid in the muscle and the liver, through very complex mechanisms that I'm going to hand wavy call lipotoxicity, leads to insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, as you know, has a number of clinical consequences, including diabetes, hypertriglyceridemia, as well as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we can really think of lipodystrophy as an extreme version of the obesity-associated metabolic syndrome. So there are certainly some differences between obese patients and lipodystrophic patients. Particularly, the fat mass is high in obesity and low in lipodystrophy. Likewise, leptin levels are going to be high in obesity and low in lipodystrophy. But energy intake is high in both states. Ectopic fat is present and contributes to the pathophysiology of insulin resistance in both cases, although this tends to be more moderate in nature in obese patients and much more extreme in patients with lipodystrophy. So I want to go back to this distinction between patients with generalized and partial lipodystrophy. And what I've done here is I've plotted percent body fat on the x-axis and the log of the leptin level on the y-axis. And patients with generalized lipodystrophy are shown in blue. Those with partial lipodystrophy are shown in red. And you can see that there is some overlap. But in both populations, the leptin levels are proportional to the amount of body fat, which is true of the general population as well, such that patients with generalized lipodystrophy typically have very low leptin levels. And those with partial lipodystrophy, some have low leptin levels, but some have much higher leptin levels. And again, it's proportional to their overall adiposity. So I, I mentioned that these patients develop insulin resistance and diabetes, and I just wanted to give you a sense of the severity of that. And here I have plotted hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of diabetes control. Um, and this dashed line here is a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5, which is the cut point for a diagnosis of diabetes. And you can see that almost everybody with generalized lipodystrophy in blue, as well as almost everybody with partial lipodystrophy in red, met the criteria for diabetes. And this is despite whatever medications they were on to treat their diabetes. Many of these patients had what we term extreme insulin resistance. Um, and I'm defining this in a couple of ways. One is that if we look at how much insulin their bodies are making, the endogenous insulin, after a glucose challenge, an oral glucose tolerance test, they might have endogenous insulin levels greater than 1,000. And to put that into perspective, uh, a typical person without diabetes who's insulin sensitive might have a, a peak insulin of about 40. So this is extremely elevated. Uh, another way to um, sort of distinguish extreme insulin resistance in a patient who requires insulin as a treatment for their diabetes is to look at their insulin doses. Uh, and these patients had insulin doses ranging between 3 and 28 units per kilogram of body mass per day. And again, to put that into perspective, a typical uh, overweight type 2 diabetic might require about 1 unit per kilo per day. So very, very high insulin requirements in some of these patients. Uh, these patients also have a very typical lipid disorder consisting of elevated triglycerides and low HDL or good cholesterol. This is the same type of lipid disorder that we see in obesity, but it tends to be much more exaggerated in lipodystrophy. And here I've plotted triglycerides on a log scale. So you can see that many of these patients have very extreme elevations. Again, I'm showing the upper limit of normal here with the dashed line at 150. Uh, and you can see that almost everybody has high triglycerides, and some of them are getting up to the 10,000 range. And this places patients at risk for complications of hypertriglyceridemia, which included those skin bumps that I showed you very early on in the talk, um, but more seriously include pancreatitis, which can be life-threatening. Uh, HDL levels, the good cholesterol, tend to be low. This is the um, cutoff for normal, so, well, cutoff for low cardiovascular risk, I should say. So you want your HDL to be above 40, and you can see that almost everybody's HDL was below 40. And I haven't shown the LDL levels because they tend to be pretty normal in this patient population. 
These patients also develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and I'm just going to give a super quick introduction to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This occurs on a spectrum. It starts from just having fat deposition in your liver. Uh, that fat deposition can progress to inflammation and scarring, which is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And, and the final common pathway for all liver diseases, including non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is cirrhosis. So if we look at the severity of this where people are on the spectrum and compare patients with obesity versus those with lipodystrophy. You can see that about 40 to 90% of patients with obesity have fatty liver disease. Uh, about 90% of our patients with lipodystrophy have fatty liver disease. Among patients with obesity and fatty liver disease, about 10 to 20% will have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. By contrast, 70 to 90% of patients with lipodystrophy have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. If you have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and you're obese, you have about a 3 to 15% risk of progression to cirrhosis over a 10 to 20 year time frame. We don't have those kind of longitudinal data in patients with lipodystrophy, but if you just look cross-sectionally at our patient population, 17% of them had cirrhosis at the time that we performed liver biopsies on them. And this is quite a young patient population. The mean age was around 18. Uh, having cirrhosis places you at risk for liver failure as well as liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma. In patients with cirrhosis, this occurs at a rate of about 2 to 5% per year. Um, I've said that this hasn't been reported in patients with lipodystrophy, but actually I've subsequently heard of one or two cases in which patients have developed hepatocellular carcinoma as a consequence of cirrhosis. So um, I'm an endocrinologist. Um, I wasn't responsible for this study, but the people who were responsible for it were endocrinologists. And endocrinologists love to replace missing hormones. This is really our passion. And patients with lipodystrophy are missing leptin. And so it seemed like a great proof of principle concept to see if you replace leptin in these patients, can you make the phenotype better, just as in those obese children with congenital leptin deficiency. And so this was designed as a proof of principle study in nine severely deficient leptin deficient patients with lipodystrophy. They were given four months of open-label treatment with leptin replacement at escalating doses up to twofold what was estimated as the physiologic replacement dose. And the results were really pretty dramatic. So in terms of diabetes control, uh, hemoglobin A1C, that measure of average diabetes control, improved by 1.9%, which is a very substantial improvement um, from 9.1 down to 7.2. And to put that into perspective, the target for A1C for patients with diabetes is less than seven. So they were close to target by four months of treatment. Um, they observed a dramatic reduction in triglycerides, 60%, starting from about 1,400 down to the 300s. Again, normal is less than 150. So they weren't completely normalized, but they were a lot closer. Liver volume was reduced by 28%, and this was presumed to be due to a reduction of fat accumulation in the liver from fatty liver disease. And really remarkably, food intake decreased from about 2,700 calories per day down to about 1,600 calories per day, consistent with the known biological mechanism of leptin. So that was 17 years ago. Uh, we have expanded those studies enormously since that time. There have now been over 100 patients uh, with lipodystrophy treated with leptin. And, and what often happens when you do a very small proof of principle study and you get dramatic results is that as you expand your patient population, those results sort of dissipate and get lost in the noise. And fortunately, that was not true with leptin replacement in patients with lipodystrophy. So this is now a much more heterogeneous population that I'm showing you. And I'm just showing two key outcomes, which are A1C for diabetes and triglycerides. And what I've done is I've divided the patients into partial lipodystrophy shown in red and generalized lipodystrophy shown in blue. And I've done that because the biology is different for these two conditions. And you may recall that the leptin levels in patients with generalized lipodystrophy were uniformly very low. So these are severely leptin deficient patients, whereas the leptin levels in patients with partial lipodystrophy are much more variable. They can range from extremely low, like a generalized lipodystrophy patient, up to normal or even elevated if that patient has obesity in the depots where fat is preserved. But you will see that it had a meaningful effect in both groups on average. So hemoglobin A1C decreased from the eights down to uh, the sixes in patients with generalized lipodystrophy from about eight down to about seven in those with partial lipodystrophy. Uh, the triglycerides decreased from about 1,000 in both groups down to about 500 in the partial lipodystrophy patients and to about 300 in the generalized lipodystrophy patients. And, and we actually did some further analyses um, to look at whether the baseline leptin level was predictive of the response to leptin, uh, and it turns out that it is. So if, if you're a partial lipodystrophy patient and you have a very low leptin level, you're more likely to respond to leptin than if you're a partial lipodystrophy patient and you have a, a normal or an increased leptin level. 
And I just want to illustrate by showing you a patient example how life-changing this hormone replacement can be in certain patients. So this is a 21-year-old woman who came to us um, from another country with generalized lipodystrophy. She had very poorly controlled diabetes and had had a history of diabetic ketoacidosis, very severe hypertriglyceridemia, and nephrotic range proteinuria, uh, increased urine protein excretion. And here um, I'm showing her laboratory values uh, and, and parameters in blue prior to leptin treatment and in purple after a year of leptin therapy. And her hemoglobin A1C decreased from the very poorly controlled range at 13.1 down to the normal range, so not even consistent with diabetes uh, after a year of leptin. And this was despite her discontinuing insulin. So she started off taking very high doses of insulin, almost 300 units a day, uh, and this normal hemoglobin A1C was off insulin entirely. Her triglycerides decreased from 6,000 to almost the normal range of 179, and her urine protein excretion decreased from more than six grams per day down to less than one gram per day. This is a photograph of the patient prior to leptin therapy. You can obviously observe that she has a lack of adipose tissue, um, but more dramatically is her increase in abdominal girth, which is due to lipid deposition in the liver. And really that's the most striking change that you can see after leptin therapy is that decrease in abdominal girth. She also lost about 20 kilos of weight, um, which of course is mostly lean body mass. And this is due to the appetite suppressing effects of leptin. So this was really a life-changing treatment for this young woman, uh, and, and she's not really the number one poster child for leptin. This is not an atypical response, although not all patients do as well as she did. So I just want to summarize what we know about the effects of leptin in leptin-deficient humans. It decreases hyperphagia because appetite is decreased. It decreases body weight. It improves insulin resistance. In patients with diabetes, it improves blood glucose and allows for reductions in insulin doses. It improves hypertriglyceridemia and steatohepatitis. I didn't talk about the reproductive phenotype in these patients, but they tend to have impaired fertility. Uh, and leptin replacement allows for normal pubertal progression. It normalizes menstrual cycles in women, and it increases fertility. So uh, I have told you before that the fundamental problem in patients with lipodystrophy is low fat mass. And um, Aaron presented data to you from the CDC showing the correlation between increased fat mass and health problems such as diabetes. But I hope that I have proven to you that having too little fat is just as unhealthy or possibly more unhealthy than having too much fat. So now let's see, how can we generalize what we've learned from patients with lipodystrophy to patients with the more common forms of insulin resistance like obesity? So in a patient with obesity, the problem is not low fat mass. The problem is a little bit further down this chain. It's excess food intake relative to energy expenditure. But after that, we see a very similar pathophysiology in patients with lipo uh, obesity compared to those with lipodystrophy. So you have this excess food intake, and you're supposed to be storing those extra calories in adipocytes so that if famine comes around, you now have that extra food storage that you can utilize in the times where food is not available. But when you become too obese, you exceed the storage capacity of your adipocytes, and you can no longer store those extra calories in the fat tissue where it belongs. And patients with obesity wind up developing ectopic lipid storage in the muscle and the liver, just like the patient with lipodystrophy. It just occurs at a later stage in the disease progression in an obese patient. And that has all of the same biological consequences in someone who is obese. Uh, it causes insulin resistance, and that can lead to diabetes, hypertriglyceridemia, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we're really dealing with the same pathophysiology. So too much fat is unhealthy. Um, so I want to focus in on this idea that the storage capacity of adipocytes is exceeded, because I think this is where we can start understanding the biological variability in patients with obesity. So some patients start to develop insulin resistance and diabetes when they are at a normal body weight or a very slightly increased body weight, and others can become severely obese without suffering health consequences. And we think that this is related to the storage capacity of adipocytes, so that people who have very flexible adipocytes or fat tissue and have the ability to store a lot of extra food there in a safe manner will not suffer ill health effects from obesity, whereas those who have a very limited flexibility of their adipose tissue will suffer those consequences at a much earlier stage of the game. So limited fat storage capacity is unhealthy. And I'm going to show you some data that support this. Um, this is a very nice uh, study that used genome-wide association to understand the role of limited adipose tissue storage in human insulin resistance. 
So um, the background here is that insulin resistance is associated with adiposity, as you saw from the CDC data that Aaron showed, and it's a key mediator of the link between obesity and its adverse impact on metabolic and cardiovascular disease. Now, I showed you that in patients with lipodystrophy, an impaired capacity of peripheral adipose tissue to expand is going to lead to ectopic lipid accumulation, and that's what leads to insulin resistance and diabetes. But we know that in the general population, at any given level of overall adiposity, there's huge variation in how insulin resistant people are and how much metabolic disease they have. And so what these authors were trying to do was to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms that at a given level of adiposity would either increase or decrease the risk of insulin resistance and metabolic disease. So what they found was that there, there were 53 independent regions in the genome that were associated with insulin resistance independent of um, the degree of adiposity, and that the genetic predisposition to insulin resistance conferred by these 53 loci um, was associated with higher metabolic risk, but at lower levels of peripheral adiposity. And I'm just going to show you one example of the data that shows this. So they divided the groups into quintiles based on genetic risk. So quintile one has the lowest genetic risk for, score. Quintile five has the highest genetic risk score. And here on the left, they're plotting leg fat mass. And so you can see that patients with the highest genetic risk have the lowest leg fat mass. Those at the lowest genetic risk have the highest fat mass. And here they're plotting the risk of type 2 diabetes. So those with the lowest genetic risk have the lowest risk of diabetes, and those who have the highest genetic risk have the highest risk of diabetes. And just to put these two things together, that means that the people with the lowest leg fat mass have the highest risk of diabetes. So that's a little non-intuitive, but makes sense if you think about this idea of peripheral adipose tissue storage capacity protecting us from ectopic lipid storage. So the next thing that these authors tried to do was to say, well, if we have an example in the general population where lower leg fat mass is associated with higher risk of insulin resistance, what if we look at a model of lipodystrophy and try to understand, are these same single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with insulin resistance in, in a somewhat more dramatic patient example. And the example they chose was familial partial lipodystrophy type 1, uh, which is characterized by an absence of fat in the legs, increased fat in the trunk. And it seems to follow sort of an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, but not exactly. And there's no known genes causing it. And so they, they speculated that maybe this was actually polygenic inheritance and that these single nucleotide polymorphisms that they had identified in the general population were playing a role here. So their hypothesis was that the, there's a polygenic predisposition to insulin resistance imparted by these 53 loci might also be contributing to the pathophys, uh, pathogenesis of this lipodystrophy subtype. Uh, and so the first thing that they demonstrated here, what they're showing is um, the difference between whole body fat mass and leg mass. So this is sort of giving us um, a, a ratio of these two. And they plotted this in blue in healthy controls uh, and in red in the patients who had familial partial lipodystrophy type 1. And what you can see is that the lipodystrophic patients had a markedly lower leg fat mass compared to their total fat mass uh, relative to those in the general population. And then they compared the number of risk alleles in these 53 loci among the patients with familial partial lipodystrophy in red uh, and the general population shown in blue. And you can see that there's a right shift in the genetic risk burden in the patients with lipodystrophy, um, suggesting that the, they have a higher burden of these risk alleles, and that might be contributing to the phenotype. Um, so they, they sort of summarized what they showed overall in the study in this graph which is showing on the x-axis um, the inverse of the genetic risk exposure, so that high genetic risk is on the left, low genetic risk is on the right. And here, um, this is the severity of the phenotype, so whether it be lipodystrophy, insulin resistance, diabetes. And over at the far left, so this is the um, severe phenotype and high genetic risk, are patients who have single gene defects that lead to insulin signaling problems. So this includes patients who have mutations in the insulin receptor or who have uh, mutations in genes like PI3 kinase or PPAR gamma that lead to lipodystrophy. Um, sort of somewhat to the right on here are patients who have familial partial lipodystrophy type 1, in which we have an increased burden of these common risk alleles that are leading to a more dramatic phenotype. And then over here, we have the common population, but extremes of the distribution for genetic risk burden uh, and hence susceptibility to insulin resistance. And then sort of the general population here 
um, certain genes that may be contributing semigolonucleotide nucleotide polymorphisms that increase risk of insulin resistance. Okay, so I want to come back to lipodystrophy um, and mention that although we can't cure lipodystrophy by replacing the missing fat mass, which is the underlying problem, we can intervene at sort of step two in the pathophysiologic process. Um, and so, um, you know, this is sort of an example of personalized medicine in which we can replace a missing hormone. And of course, we would love to be able to do the same thing in obesity, but common obesity and insulin resistance are much, much more complex than what we're dealing with in a patient population like those with lipodystrophy. So I want to offer some conclusions uh, first about fat as a storage organ. Um, and, and this sort of takes us back again to the 1970s to the 1990s, where um, white adipose tissue is a passive storage organ. But I think it's important as a, importance as a storage organ goes beyond that. It's actually allowing metabolic flexibility in response to changing food availability. So it's allowing us to store fat in times of plenty and to utilize that fat in times of, sor of shortage. And the capacity to expand adipose tissue is critical to maintain metabolic health in the context of nutrient excess, which of course is our problem in this day and age. And inadequate white adipose tissue storage is gonna to lead to ectopic fat storage, both in extreme examples such as lipodystrophy, but also in more common obesity and insulin resistance. Fat is also serving a key function as an endocrine organ. So white adipose tissue, as we've discussed, secretes leptin as well as other adipokines. And leptin in particular is serving as a signal of long-term energy storage. Low leptin acts as a starvation signal, which leads to hyperphagia. And leptin replacement corrects hyperphagia and metabolic disease, but only in leptin deficient states, such as congenital leptin deficiency or lipodystrophy. Um, so this is the work of many, many people at the NIH, University of Michigan, University of Cambridge, UT Southwestern, and none of this would have been possible without our patients and our families. Happy to take questions. Thanks. Uh, Jan? Well, I've avoided the term ghrelin because ghrelin is made by the stomach. Um, and therefore is not an adipocyte-derived hormone. And so I, it's not that it has no role in regulating appetite, um, but there are many, many things that I didn't discuss in this talk that regulate appetite. So when I talked about leptin regulating appetite, that was a massive oversimplification of the appetite regulatory system. Uh, putting together the message of Aaron's talk and your talk, what happens if you convert most of your white fat to brown fat. Is that, is that a risk? That, that is a very interesting question. Uh, are you going to lack a storage capacity uh, to store your excess calories? Well, well, I think Aaron might argue no, because you're just going to burn those extra calories. So you don't really need to store them anywhere. Well, the simple answer is uh, it's not a problem, as Rebecca says, I think, but also because, as we've been showing, the amount of deep, the, the fat that's brownable is 5% of the total white fat in the body. So even if you browned all that you really can, you still have 95% of your fat mass that can then serve to re release leptin. So you're never going to get into any trouble. If, we, if there was a possibility of browning all of the sub-Q fat and everything else, that would be a problem. But we've never seen that in adult humans. And, and by the way, before anyone asks, we have no idea what brown fat is like in patients with lipodystrophy. So a little quick test. For those of you who remember your session on HIV therapies, does anyone remember the complications of heart therapy? Okay, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, uh, I, my question centers around that. S some forms of induced lipodystrophy, like so, in, is uh, probably due to in, inhibition of proteases in heart therapy. Mm -hmm. Has leptin been attempted to, to look at those kinds of syndromes? Uh, it has. Um, they have been pretty small studies, but nicely done, randomized placebo-controlled trials. Um, I want to say the total number of patients is in the order of 25 to 30. Uh, those patients tend to have relatively mild metabolic disease, although it can be variable, and they tend to have not terribly low leptin levels. And so the response to leptin therapy is sort of predictable based on that, in that it's a fairly modest response. So, uh, 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 nutrition or diet on, on diabetes, you didn't say anything about it. Does it have any effect? 
So, so diet management is critically important for patients both with common type 2 diabetes as well as those with what we call lipoatrophic diabetes, which is the diabetes associated with lipodystrophy. Uh, and fundamentally, we recommend that patients follow the same kind of diet that we're all supposed to be following that's a heart-healthy diet that's not high in sugars, uh, sort of balanced amounts of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Um, but it's, it's absolutely essential. Okay, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure these folks uh, will hang around for any additional questions, but I want to thank the speakers, Aaron and, and Rebecca, for a really nice presentations. Um, thank you all for attending. And um, um, I believe Wynn will be back for the next section, uh, so you'll, you'll get to hear uh, his take on, on the, the next sessions. But thank you all again, and have a good day.